The next moderator, uh, Dr. Khaled Atavi, a great friend. He has a uh, consultant neonatologist in a very busy Latifa hospital, and he has completed his master's and PhD degrees from um, Shams University and uh, uh, master's in healthcare management from Royal College of Ireland. Uh, he is actually uh, uh, got a lot of publications and he is a editorial board member for many journals and his main interest is uh, in uh, ventilation, nutrition and brain injury and protection. Uh, welcome Dr. Khaled. Uh, thank you Monica for the invitation and uh, uh, this successful uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, let me uh, take the uh, opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Anderson, who is a professor of pediatric neuropsychology at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health uh, School of Psychology, uh, Psychological Sciences, Monarch uh, University, and the director of uh, Victorian Infant Brain Studies uh, team based uh, at the uh, Mordoch uh, Children Research Institute. He is, psychologist, uh, he is a psychologist interested in the cognitive development of children and for over than uh, 20 years has focused on uh, understanding the mechanisms uh, underlying uh, cognitive and learning problems in children born very preterm. His research involves observational outcome studies, longitudinal neuroimaging studies, and numerous randomized control trials uh, assessing the long-term benefits and consequences of obstetric, perinatal, and developmental uh, intervention. Uh, Dr. Anderson will be giving us a talk about the ongoing neurodevelopmental challenges facing the children born very preterm. So welcome, Dr. Anderson. Thank you very much, and good evening to everybody. Um, Hopefully you can see my screen now and hear me. Yes, so, um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's, it's great to be part of this symposium. It's uh, a great lineup of speakers and it, it's, uh, I'm very pleased that there was space in the program to talk about uh, long-term neurodevelopment. Um, I suspect that uh, most of the audience has a, a fair understanding of what some of the challenges are that face children born very preterm. So I thought tonight what I would do would be to focus on um, five points, which I think are particularly relevant um, to today because there is a huge amount of research out there in this area. And um, I think these particular points I'm hoping will help you um, in your interpretation of this enormous amount of literature and ultimately help you with counselling families who uh, have a, a very preterm child. Now tonight, I'm gonna to be focusing on the challenges facing children born very preterm, but the actual concepts I'm gonna be talking about are very relevant for pretty much any uh, neonatal condition which impacts on the brain. And I'd also just like to, uh, before I get into uh, the presentation, note that uh, the, the data I'm gonna be presenting today is all data from studies which I've been involved in, but there are many, many groups around the world which have um, are doing great long-term neurodevelopmental research. And most of the points I'm um, discussing tonight could be supported by research from many other groups from around the world. Yeah. Why is that not? Sorry. Okay, here we go. So as I've already implied, there is a huge amount of, of research in, the, in this area. And uh, in my mind, the core domains which people are focused on are sensory, motor, cognitive, and educational um, domains. And there is, in my mind, a huge amount of evidence to indicate that there are you know, challenges for children born very preterm across all these domains. For example, children born very preterm 
uh, have increased risk of visual acuity problems, visual uh, perceptual issues. They're more likely to have motor problems. Uh, you'll probably know that about one in 10 will develop cerebral palsy. But on top of that, another 40% will develop a condition called developmental coordination disorder. In terms of uh, cognition, children born very preterm um, perform uh, below children born full term as a group on tests of IQ, attention, information processing, memory, executive function, language, and any other cognitive domain you, you want to look at. And not surprising given all this, that these children are at risk of, of difficulties at school on standardized tests of, of basic educational skills, such as handwriting, maths, reading, spelling, the group, as um, performs more poorly than um, children born full term. They're also more likely to repeat a grade at school and need support at school. Now, most of the research in the area has focused on looking at uh, main group differences. So when you do a literature review, what you'll find, and, and uh, if you look up research that I've been involved in, you'll see a lot of um, means and, and differences between the means but um, what I one of the things I do want to um, focus on today is is going beyond looking at mean group differences and, and hopefully that can help us in better understanding long-term outcomes at an individual level rather than just at a group level. So these are the things I want to talk about today whether neurodevelopmental outcomes are improving with time I want to talk about looking at rates of impairment rather than mean group differences. Look, I want to talk about individual profiles, uh, developmental stability, and mental health. So starting with uh, changing neurodevelopmental outcomes, are we seeing improved outcomes with improvements in obstetric and neonatal care for these um, women and babies? I've been fortunate enough to be involved with the Victorian Infant Collaborative Study Group for a number of decades. Uh, this is a group which has been recruiting a cohorts of children born extremely preterm in the state of Victoria and Australia for uh, a number of, of, of um, decades. <clears throat> and this is a group which was um, headed for, by Lex Doyle for a long period of time and more recently by Ginny Chong. And in a recent paper, which was published um, last year, where we looked at two-year outcomes, we compared the two-year outcomes for our four most recent cohorts, uh, cohorts born in 91, 92, 97, 2005, and um, 2016. And unfortunately, I don't think you can... Oh, here we go. You can see my uh, mouse now. So if we look at survival... Um, across these four eras, you can see that there has been a gradual increase in survival with the most dramatic being from the early 90s to the uh, late 90s. And so that's a that's great news. Cerebral palsy, there's been some talk about that in the literature that there's been a reduction in cerebral palsy. We have not seen that for a long period of time, but more, most recently we have seen a drop in cerebral palsy which is great news. And we've definitely seen a drop in, um, in severe cerebral palsy. In terms of developmental delay and neurodevelopmental disability, there's no obvious trend of improvements in these particular areas. But if we put all this together and we look at those children who, who are born externally preterm, who survive with no major disability, we do see um, quite a marked, in my mind, increase in the proportion of those children who are surviving without major disability, um, nearly 20% over this period of time. And so that's really great news. And that is suggesting that um, with these improvements in care, we are seeing improvements in outcome. But this is outcome to two years. And most of you will know, or many of you will know, that uh, two-year outcomes do not um, do not equal long-term outcomes, and so we do need to um, make to see whether uh, this corresponds with improvements later in life. Now, a few years earlier, we looked at eight-year outcomes in these same cohorts. Uh, this the the 
group of interest were the children born in Victoria, extremely preterm in 2005, at eight years of age. And the domains of interest were IQ, reading, spelling, and maths. And so we wanted to see whether the children born in 2005 were actually doing better than the children born in 91, 92, and children born in 1997 on these different domains. If they were performing better, then these diamonds and 95% confidence interval should be positive to the right of uh, this line, zero. But you can see that these mean group differences, these diamonds, are actually predominantly to the left of zero, negative, which is, generally speaking, um, suggesting that the long-term outcome for this particular cohort born in 2005 was doing slightly poorer. Now, that's obviously quite controversial and difficult to interpret, and we don't really know what that means. But what we um, can say is that we're very confident that at eight years of age in Victoria, uh, we are not seeing improvement in long-term outcomes in these particular domains. Now, it, uh, we need to see whether that um, is is um, consistent when we look at the 2016-2017 cohort when they reach eight years of age. Now I'm gonna to move to looking at rate of impairment because when we're looking at domains such as IQ, um, motor functioning, educational outcomes, attention, executive function, language, and so forth, what we tend to do is, is look at main group differences. Here's one example. Here's a group of children born in Victoria in 1997, extremely preterm and eight years of age. Here was their IQ, uh, about 93. And that's in contrast to a comparison group of children born full term, uh, very well matched. And you can see they have an IQ of just over 105. And that's, a, a, it was basically a 13 point difference. Now, a 13 point difference in IQ is a big difference. That's statistically significant, but also very clinically significant. So it's a big difference, but how do we interpret that? How do we use that to help us in um, counseling families and talking to families about the prognosis of their child? Well, I, I don't think it's particularly helpful. Another way is to look at rates of impairment. And use, using data from this same group of children, what we actually um, can see is that half the children, 49%, actually have no intellectual impairment. Just over a third of them have mild impairment. So that's an IQ, which is between 85 and 70. And there's only 15% of kids who we're probably most concerned about who have an IQ of less than 70, two standard deviations below the mean. So I think, when we look at mean group differences, it's not really telling us all the stories and um, it can actually give us um, a, a poorer picture of, of outcomes than what is really um, occurring. We can do the same with educational outcomes or any other outcomes. Here's the same group of children born in 1997 in Victoria, extremely preterm here in red, looking at reading, spelling and maths, and you can see they're performing well below um, children born full term. And you might expect that based on that, there's a high percentage of these children who are actually got a reading impairment or a spelling impairment, maths impairment. But when you actually look at the figures, the rates actually surprised us. They were much lower than what the mean group differences may have um, suggested. We see that only 30% of the extremely preterm children have a reading impairment, a maths impairment, and it's actually fewer for spelling, um, less than 20%. And we, when we look at the children who we're really concerned about, those children who've got marked problems in reading, spelling, maths, the, the rates are, are really low, about 10% or less. So I think when we're looking at the, the literature and our own data, we need to go well beyond looking at mean group differences because um, it can, but when we look at the rates of impairment, I think this is information which is helpful for families to understand. They can understand that, okay, yes, there is a, a chance that their child's going to have an intellectual impairment. There is a chance that their child's going to have an ac academic um, difficulty, but there's also um, actually a really good chance that their child's not going to have a problem in those domains. 
Uh, whether we look at mangrove differences or we look at rates of impairments, what we're actually doing is comparing a group of children born very preterm or externally preterm with another group, a comparison group, which is usually children born full term. And we get a particular story based on, on those main group differences or rates of impairments. But for those of you who work in follow-up clinics, you'll know that the children who come in at two, four, six, eight, whatever age it is, um, they're all different and they're all presenting with different um, difficulties and strengths and they've got different profiles. So um, there are now a number of studies which have looked at or done analyses using person oriented um, statistics um, to look at individual profiles or whether there are subgroups of children who are born very preterm who are exhibiting specific type of problems. And we've done some research in that area as well. We use a, a technique called latent profile analysis. And here's one study, the results from one study done by an honor student of mine, uh, which this data is not yet published, but was done some time ago. This was based on a group of children born very preterm. They were seen at 13 years of age. We did a, a fairly detailed neuropsychological assessment, including um, domains of IQ, attention, memory, language, and executive function. And then the latent profile analysis identified four strong um, profiles or clusters of children. The biggest group of children was actually this group, the blue group, light blue group here, which represents more than a third of the group. And this is a group of children who are born very preterm, who are performing um, age appropriately or above in all these domains that we looked at in this paper. The second largest group is this um, group represented by the red line. And, and collectively, this, these two groups represent more than two thirds of the children born very preterm. This red group is also performing well, generally speaking, with, if you, you might want to say, selective difficulties in attention and language. So this is a group of children who tend to um, be doing well, but are having problems in language and attention. Then we have a relatively small group of 30 odd children in green here who are struggling across the board, but are actually got really poor attention problems. And maybe these attention problems are the source or at least contributing to some of their problems in the other domains, including IQ, memory, language and executive function. And then we've got a very, very small group of kids. Um, in this case, um, um, uh, 10, 10 or so children who are actually performing really poorly across all domains. So, Children born very preterm are not all alike. They are quite different. And I think this is really important information for you to know for when you're counseling um, uh, families who have just had a very preterm baby. Uh, this is just another example that we've done with using latent profile analysis. This time we've drilled into attention. Attention can be broken up into different subdomains. For example, selective attention, shifting attention, divided attention, and looking at behavioral aspects of attention and when we just focus on attention we can see different profiles in this particular analysis we found three different groups one group where they're um, showing good attention age appropriate attention another group which is showing low average attention and another group which is showing poor attention particularly in the area of divided attention which seems to be an area of concern particularly for this group of children so um, I think in terms of long-term outcome for children born very preterm, it's, it's, it's not controversial. We know that these children have a range of problems, um, some, but there is enormous variability. Some children do not exhibit any problems at all. Some children exhibit mild problems and some children exhibit severe problems, while um, but the nature and profile of the problems also vary. So really the focus of long-term outcome come research in my mind and this is what we focus on and many other groups focus on is trying to understand the mechanisms for um, the difficulties that these children have and why some children do um, really poorly and other children do really well some children have attention problems while other children have language problems why is that the case and we've heard 
some of that were um, a story from um, Dr. Inda um, uh, just before. Now I'm just going to quickly um, talk about developmental stability because many of the out outcome clinics around the world follow up children born very preterm to two years of age. Some clinics follow children up to four or five years of age, but very rarely do um, clinics follow up children beyond that. Now I know there are cases ar around the world that do, which is fantastic, but in most cases, children are not follow up, followed up for very long at all. So is, is, that, is that a problem? Well, I'm gonna argue that it is a problem. In this particular study, we followed up a group of children born very preterm. We saw them at two years and eight years of age, and we categorized their disability as having no disability, mild, moderate, severe at two years of age, and the same at eight years, no disability, mild, moderate, and severe. The children who fall in this diagonal are the children who stay in the same disability category at two and eight years of age. Now that represents less than 50% of the cohort. More than 50% of the cohort actually changed disability categories. If you have a look at the children um, who had no disability at two years of age, there was um, quite a significant, about 40% of them actually did have a disability at eight years of age. For the mild disability group, um, uh, a number of those actually at eight years of age did not have a disability. While those at two who had a moderate to severe disability, they tended to have um, lowest, less severe disability at eight years of age. So I'm probably not telling you anything new there that um, early developmental assessments are not particularly um, predictive of later assessments. And so if you're assessing a child at two years of age, and they are doing, they are delayed, you need to be very careful as to um, how you um, pass that information on to families because within a year or so, they may have caught up and be doing very well. Here's another, um, uh, uh, some more data showing the same thing. This, in this study, we've focused on language development. And it's actually the same cohort. We saw children at two, five, seven, 13 years of age where we did an assessment of language. This line up here represents the mean performance on language for the term group, the control group. And you can see that as a group, they, their performance was very, very stable from two to 13 years of age when we um, utilized age standardized norms. This dotted line represents the very preterm group. And again, you can see that that line the mean line for the very preterm group was also very stable across time. And as such, the mean difference between the two groups remain very, um, very um, similar across each time point. But when we look at, in particular, at individuals, we don't see that at all. We see marked variability in profiles. We see one group of children who actually performed well at two in terms of their language, and that persisted right through to 13 years of age. We've got another group of children here who we called the um, precocious group who were doing really well in terms of their language at two, but then uh, fell away a little bit. Um, and by uh, seven and 13 year, years were performing within the age appropriate range, but slightly below. We've got this group of children who were a little bit delayed in terms of their language at two years of age and then quickly caught up by five and seven years of age and performed well thereafter. There was this group here who actually uh, are exhibiting mild language problems from two and that persisted right through to 13 years of age. And then we've got this small group of children who started off with um, quite marked language problems and that persisted right throughout. So based on a, an assessment of language at two years of age, you can't really have a great deal of confidence as to what their performance is going to be in terms of language uh, by middle to late childhood. And that's the point I wanna make. And finally, I wanna talk about mental health. Now we've been focusing on these particular domains and these are very important domains. These are domains which are critically important for the adaptive functioning for the child. And while, uh, as I've just been talking about, 
development happens rapidly and their performance can vary from early childhood through to middle childhood. By middle to late childhood, we actually have a pretty good understanding of where each child sits in for each one of these domains. By middle to late childhood, we know whether children have visual and hearing problems. We know whether a child's got cerebral palsy or, or is clumsy. We know where the child um, falls in terms of most domains of cognition. And the family and the child knows where um, they sit in terms of their academic progress. What um, I think from late childhood into adolescence and into early adulthood, uh, people start worrying about is the individual's happiness and their um, psychological health. And while we know that behaviour problems can um, present and emerge very early in life, and uh, many of you have experienced that, really um, the peak time of a, a whole range of psychiatric disorders, including anxiety and depression, does come on in adolescence and early adulthood. So I think this is a really important area which has lacked a lot of research and partly because we it, they're not the major issues which people are focusing on when children are being followed up in early childhood when these are a focus of those programs. Now um, about 10 years ago Sam Johnson and Neil Marlowe people who are experts in the area of long-term follow-up did a review looking at behavior problems in preterm children and they Came, they identified three areas, inattention and hyperactivity, emotional problems, including anxiety and depression, and social interactions. These were the, the areas of most concern, and they termed it the, the preterm behavioural uh, phenotype. And there was a thought that this may translate to higher rates of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, anxiety and mood disorders, and autism spectrum disorder. And the best way of, of looking at whether clinical populations such as children born very preterm or individuals born very preterm are at increased risk for psychiatric disorders is to do structured psychiatric interviews with them. That gives you very accurate information on the psychiatric diagnosis, enables you to um, collect a whole lot of risk and resilience factors. The problem is that to do this, it's, it's very difficult. Um, response rates can be low and resulting in representativeness, um, um, non-representativeness. And also many of these disorders, for example, autism, are low incidence and so we lack power. So one way of really um, understanding the psychiatric, the rate of psychiatric disorders in very preterm children and, and adulthood is to, is to do a meta-analysis. And the best form of meta-analysis is an individual participant um, data meta-analysis where we pull the data from a whole range of different cohorts and that's what we did. There's a group of us um, who collaborate in this uh, collaboration called the Adults Born Preterm International Collaboration. Here are the different um, groups from around the world who participated in this initiative and, and the different authors of this particular paper. And to be included in this analysis, uh, the cohorts had to involve very low birth weight or very preterm um, children, as well as the comparison group or involving a term normal birth weight um, children or individuals. And they needed to have made a psychiatric diagnosis based on a structured interview utilizing DSM or ICD diagnoses. And we were particularly interested in autism, ADHD, anxiety, mood disorder, and disruptive behavior disorders. We pulled data from 10 cohorts. We had one cohort from the US, one from Canada, two from Australia, one from New Zealand, two from the UK, one from Norway, uh, one from Finland and one from Germany. And you can see the numbers uh, varied quite a bit from study to study as did the selection criteria and also the age at which they were had the interview. The type of interview used also varied um, across studies and the, the psychiatric disorders of interest also vary from study to study. But what we found was um, a marked increase in the very preterm group across a, a number of different diagnoses. Starting with ADHD, we found that 
nearly 19% of our group who were born very preterm met eligibility for ADHD in contrast to about eight and a half percent of the term controls, which led to an increase odds ratio of around uh, 5.4 or 5.3 when it's adjusted for a whole range of factors. In terms of ASD or autism, the, there was about five and a half percent of the very preterm group met eligibility for autism in contrast to 0.5 of a percent in the control group, which is an increased odds ratio of about 10 and a half. For an anxiety disorder, that was the um, most common disorder across both groups, 16% for the very preterm, 11% for the controls, um, an odds ratio of about two. Mood disorder, um, very, quite similar, but we still had an increased odds ratio of, of 1.5 or 1.6 in the uh, for the very preterm group. We were not expecting an increase in disruptive behaviour um, disorders uh, based on past research, and that's what we found. There was no difference there. Um, and there was also no difference in terms of eating disorder or psychiatric disorder. In fact, um, the rates were slightly lower in those born very preterm. So um, what are my take-home messages regarding long-term follow-up? Well, as, as um, it's pretty clear from all the research which has been done, very preterm survivors or as a group are at increased risk for a range of long-term neurodevelopmental challenges. While there seems to be maybe some um, improvements in short-term outcomes, at the moment there is limited evidence that long-term outcomes are improving with the improvements in medical care and survival rates. Also really want to highlight that there is really significant heterogeneity in the long-term outcomes for these individuals. The vast majority of these individuals do not exhibit major impairments. Many of them have fantastic outcomes. They also differ greatly in terms of the type of problems they have as well as the severity of problems. Also wanted to highlight that the early assessments of development such as at two years of age only has moderate agreement with later assessments in childhood and adolescence. So um, we need to think about that when we're following up these children and giving advice to families. And the mental health of very preterm survivors is a major issue as I hope I've been able to highlight tonight. Now, um, going forward, we really need to um, improve our, our um, prediction of who's going to um, have problems going forward and what type of problems so that we can imp um, uh, more target our surveillance programs and early intervention programs or as Terry talks about uh, neuro rehabilitation um, programs. We also need to be very cautious when we're counselling families because hopefully you can see that um, no two children are alike they show um, uh, differences in severity of outcomes and different um, profiles. And also that the, the type of that problems can change with increasing age. A child can have a delay in some, in, for example, in language, but by 13 or by five years of age, uh, they could have really caught up to their peers. We need ongoing surveillance throughout childhood and into adulthood. Um, while the major domains of sensory, motor, cognitive and educational outcomes are pretty well known by middle childhood and late childhood, there are other things going on um, which emerge into adulthood such as um, mental health. And so, and I, I would argue that mental health problems should be a core component of surveillance programs. Right, so I've run slightly over time. Um, here are the references from the studies I've I've talked about tonight and uh, you can get that from my slides. And I just want to acknowledge all the people I've worked with uh, that have been out, that uh, have helped me with these studies from the Victorian Infant Collaborative Study Group and the Victorian Infant Brain Studies Group. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this elaborative, uh, uh, very important uh, lecture.
And uh, to tell you the truth, this is uh, uh, what we need to uh, follow up our uh, patients and cases. Uh, although it is somehow difficult in the area where the pa patients are keeping moving between the countries, so you don't have the long-term uh, follow-up for longer uh, than uh, two years. Uh, and um, I'm having a few questions for you here. The first one is, uh, when using Bailey's scale at two years, uh, at two years, what score do you use for normal, moderate, severe impairment? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. I mean, Bailey scales is is um, being the subject of a lot of uh, uh, debate in the literature, mainly because um, there, there has been some suggestion that the scores from the Bailey three uh, underestimate development, which sorry, overestimate development, which then results in an underestimation of um, delay. And now, uh, most places around the world um, are using the Bailey, have been using the Bailey 3. Uh, the Bailey 4 was released about a year ago, and that's got a newer norms, and hopefully that those norms are more accurate. So I would be suggesting that people use, uh, can if they can have norms which are relevant to their local area, and that not, may not be the case for a lot of people attending tonight, that uh, they do use those new norms. Uh, so the cutoffs we use uh, for delay are those less than one standard deviation as being a mild impairment, um, and moderate severe impairment would be anything less than two standard deviations below the mean. We in Australia, um, I do have Australian norms, which is helpful, but that's relatively new. Before that, we, we tended to use control groups to help us in, in making those cutoffs. Thank you. Uh, there, is another, there is another question. Uh, how early the assessment need to be done? Uh, well, I think it's a really a practical issue. Uh, I know many of these babies are going uh, through um, follow-up programs from very early in, in life. And I think that's really important because uh, the best way to work out whether a child is developmentally delayed or whether the child actually has a, an ongoing impairment is to see them regularly and to monitor their, their development. So, uh many groups use um their main follow-up time point as 18 months and many use 24 months our our recommendation would be 24 months because we've um, published literature to show that 24 months is more predictive of long-term outcome than 18 months neither is fantastic but 24 months is better than 18 months but I think um, you shouldn't just wait to 24 months. Um, by the time a baby's at 24 months and is exhibiting problems, then um, it's often, um, you've often missed the gate. Um, you can start a whole range of, of um, interventions well before that if the child is having problems. So um, depending upon the, 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 the um, center that you're working in, I would be suggesting uh, very frequent assessments in the first year of life and then a major um, neurodevelopmental assessment at 24 months. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question here till now. Uh, uh, what is the relation between prematurity and math disability? Yes, well, of all the academic um, difficulties that um, children born very preterm have, uh, the area of mathematics is is the area which is of most concern. Um, I have a PhD student that's been, is looking at that at the moment. And the rates are, are pretty high in this group of children. We, we're really not sure whether that's due to difficulties with processing speed, working memory, um, whether it's a problem with executive function. So these are all 
things that uh, our group and many others are trying to sort out, but there are clearly a number of factors which are contributing to their problems in maths problems. But in saying that, as uh, I've, I've tried to highlight today, not, not all children born very preterm have maths problems. A lot of them um, don't. But it, it is an area of concern, definitely. Okay, thank you. There is a, a question popped up now. Could uh, you comment on the socioeconomic status estimation for those cohort studies in association to the cultural difference among countries? Mm. Yes, I think um, that's a, a very important point. And I think that um, uh, the when you are looking at the long-term outcome literature, you do have to um, look very carefully at where the the study is being um, undertaken and the the different health systems and the socioeconomic um, uh, characteristics. In Australia, um, we have a, a universal medical system and we don't uh, probably have the level of poverty that some uh, many other countries have, including the US. So we, we do not necessarily see a huge percentage of children born into um, very disadvantaged families. Um, of course, we, we, we do have some of those children, but we don't have this um, significant uh, uh, proportion that um, other countries may have. So I think that uh, you will see differences from country to country. There have been studies which have shown differences um, within countries from regions within different uh, different regions within countries. So I think long-term outcomes can vary from country to country, and I think they can even vary from within countries. So I think that they're, they're factors that need to be considered. Some of them are going to be socio-demographic characteristics, um, and some of them are going to be um, clinical characteristics. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, uh, and thank you for being uh, with us till uh, 1 a.m. at your uh, country. And uh, by this, we can conclude the session.